and round. Anyways, um, Hey guys, until somebody picks me up to uh, sponsor me like a VPN or whatever, uh, this video is sponsored by me. That's my merchandise, bunch of stuff, whatever. Links in the description down below. Enjoy the video. Hi, and welcome to my channel. So today I'm doing something kind of new, new to me. I don't know if anybody else is doing the same thing. I've seen people do similar parts of what I am planning on doing. Um, so, like, I love watching Bailey Sarian, okay, uh, for her Murder, Mystery, and Makeup Mondays. Shana Sha, right? Okay, so I love watching her, but I can't do makeup. You can watch my video that I did the other day. I'm never going to do makeup again. This is going to be the extent of it, my eyes. However, I'll probably do one of her eye makeup tutorials because she's she's pretty genius and I love her. And, um... Anyway, so I love watching her, and I love watching Cindy Black. There are a couple other girls that <sighs> do the murder mystery thing. And I've watched them, but they're kind of pretentious. And some of them get on my nerves. I'm not going to drop any names because I'm not trying to be messy. But, um, yeah, anyway, so this is not that. I'm not doing murder mystery because there's already enough people out there doing that and um if it ain't broke don't fix it right so I'm not trying to hop into something that other people are already doing and doing an excellent job of it very well researched all of them they're just they're pretty phenomenal so I'm not doing that um so then I was like well what else interests me well I love ghost stories I've got lots of ghost stories of my own uh, also, yeah, that's, um, other people are already doing that, and I'm just like, you know, hmm. See, what really got me thinking about it is because I listen to this podcast, uh, That's Why We Drink, and I love them, and, uh, that kind of got me thinking. I was like, ooh, podcasts, but I already have two podcasts. I have the one that's my hypocritical view podcast, which I just relaunched that this last Wednesday. And then I have the one that I just started that I'm doing with my mom on Sundays where we like drink and talk about her life story. So I wasn't trying to do another podcast series. So anyways, the point is, is I decided that what else am I passionate about? Well, guess what? I'm passionate about women who have been horrified. So women basically who uh, went against the rules and did their own thing and history remembered them as nothing more than sluts and whores and hoes and bitches and tricks and suck them dicks, right? Yeah, I wanna talk about those women. So, um, because they're all my idols. And uh, yeah, I'm really passionate about them. I feel like too many women have been forgotten. And I know that there are people, I've seen some that talk about women, but not necessarily just women. Am I talking just necessarily about women? You know, I don't know. I don't know where this is gonna go. There is one woman that I wanna talk about, um, but she ended up living her life as a man and since she's dead I'm not really sure how to talk about her so I'm not sure if she would want to be remembered as a man or a woman anyways anyways so that's what we're doing but guess what here's where Bailey really inspired me since I don't do makeup and me sitting here doing my makeup while I'm talking about this kind of stuff just doesn't make any sense because uh-uh, no. Um, what I do do is I love to paint implied genitalia. So, pussies. That's what I paint, okay? I love painting it. You can look on my website, okay? This right here, yeah, this is all me. This is, um, it's called Passion. And it's, uh, so, the, like, the shirt's okay, but, like, when I go like this, like, you can't. It doesn't, so you have to stretch it out, right? Anyways, um, 
yeah so this is just like uh this is called passion in salmon available on my website selfish plug long story short so that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna talk about these women who have been horrified in history and i'm gonna paint some pussies so i've already gotten the uh the canvas ready Okay. If you don't follow me on Instagram, be sure to because that's where I'm always sharing my paintings and my artwork and whatnot. Anyways, I was going for like this leathery feel, well this look to it. And so for today's lady, this is going to be perfect, in my opinion, IMO, uh, because today, today, we're going to talk about Mary Wollstonecraft. Have you heard of her? Because guess what? I hadn't heard of her prior to deciding that I wanted to do this little series. Oh my gosh, I'm shaking the hell out of the table. Sorry. I'll try my, my best not to. Anyways, I didn't know who the hell she was until I picked up this book. Now this book, when, um, well not when, but like a few years ago, I bought this book. And I bought it when I bought like a bunch of other books, roughly the same kind of idea thing. And so when it arrived, I got distracted and it went up on a bookshelf and I totally forgot about it. So then when I had this idea a couple weeks ago, I was like, all right, if I'm going to do this, let me learn about somebody new for like the first episode, right? Let me do that because that sounds fun. And I just went like this. And the first person that I, that it turned to, which of course it would have been nice if I would have um, kept the pages marked. Anyways. Uh, it was Mary Wollstonecraft and I'm like, okay, cool. Who is she? Well, guess what? She's Mary Shelley's mom, Mary Shelley, the one who wrote Frankenstein. Yeah. So that's who Mary Wollstonecraft is. And other than that, I mean, what else do you know? All right. So I'm going to start painting while we get cracking on this. Okay. Wow, this is interesting. Um, totally new little thing here, guys. Um, never done this before, so bear with me. Um, so, Mary Wollstonecraft was born in um, April 27th, 1759. She was a Taurus, all right, um, in a place called Spitalfields, London, because that's a great place for a whore to be born. So Mary Wollstonecraft was the second uh, oldest child of Elizabeth Dixon and Edward John Wollstonecraft, I believe. And uh, she had an older brother named Jim, Ned, Ned, Ned. And uh, anyways, uh, Okay, here's why I wanted to talk about her. So she was known as a, uh, like a philosopher. She was a war correspondent. She, she did like all kinds of shit. And history for the longest time remembered her as just a, just a silly woman, you know, just some chick that has some issues. And that was all because her husband uh, father of Mary Shelley wrote like this memoir after she died and um, it was kind of bullshit right um, okay well that wasn't bullshit what was bullshit was what he had written was uh, like just this memoir and some of her unpublished stuff but then he was like yeah yeah so she uh, she tried to commit suicide a couple of times and she kind of like was really passionate about shit and like he just kind of said, kind of like aired out her business, right? Which her contemporaries at the time who were like her fans, they thought that was kind of some bullshit. Um, but whatever, after, after a while, nobody was really on her side anymore. So it was like for well over a hundred years, like nobody remembered her for the stuff that she had done. And now you're probably wondering, okay, cool. So what did she do? Well, Okay, so she grew up in this town of Spitalfields, and her father, 
Edward John Wollstonecraft. So like he was this total dick, right? Like he would beat her mom. He, um, okay, so see what had happened was her grandpa, his dad passed away and in the will left them like a bunch of money. Now they were already kind of like, okay, people. And um, as far as, what are you doing? What are you, back up. They were, uh, they were okay. What the fuck am I saying? So they were like, uh, you know, they're, they're doing their thing, whatnot. Um, just living their life. And so grandpa dies and leaves them like a buttload of money. But by them, I mean, um, so Mary's dad and then Mary's oldest brother and then also, uh, Mary's aunt. So I guess like Edward's sister, Edward. Yeah, Edward. Um, but like nothing was left for any of the girls. Now, I don't know if she had any other brothers, but she did have, see, there were seven of them. So she had like, the fuck was that? So she had like five other siblings, right? And uh, a couple of, most of them, some of them, whatever. There, there were some sisters in there, um, like Eliza and um, Erlina or something. Like that. I don't know, some, some really pretty name. And of course, naturally, I don't remember it. Um, Anyways, so oh yeah, so so grandpa dies and leaves them this money, right? So then her dad, uh, he's like, "Yo, I want to go be a uh, squire." Is that what they called it? Yeah, a country squire. And I'm like, what the hell is a country squire? So that's a landowner, all right? So it's like, you know, part of the gentry, like, hey, you know, we're, we're cool, look at us. So he moves them out to this place called something. Oh, to Epping Forest in Essex, okay? But then he didn't know shit about farming, so that failed. And like this whole time he's like spending money like crazy, the family's not doing well. And, uh, he is, you know, he's drinking, so he's going crazy as far as like being just a dick and he just starts just beating the hell out of her mom. And she watches this and she watches this and she sees this and she even like started sleeping outside of her mom's bedroom to keep him from being able to beat her. And like her mom never really appreciated it. So she got like nothing out of that. So like over time, she just started to really hate her dad and really started to just kind of feel sorry for her mom. And she's just like, you know what? By 15, she was like, I am never getting married again. Not only that, but guess what? There wasn't a dowry for her anyways, because her dad basically made the whole family go broke. And so whatever status they might have had, uh, he kind of destroyed it for them. And... I don't know. So she was like, you know what? Marriage isn't for me. So she kind of like was off trying to do her own thing for a while, whatever. And um, anyways, so there's there's that part. Moving on. Uh, after she decided to move out. No. Okay. So before she moved out. So when she was like 14. Now here's, here's where it gets kind of iffy. Because there's a lot of parts in her history that can be construed as she might have been gay she might have been gay or she might have been um bisexual uh i guess the jury's out on that but you tell me what you think okay so when she was like 14 she had a friend and now i'm not sure if this is fanny or not i wasn't quite clear on this because she had this friend fanny who was like her love okay like her her love and um but we'll get to fanny here in a minute um but it was this one friend god damn it i, I wish i'd have written it down but anyway so she had told her friend and i quote she said and i quote i will have the first place in your heart or none so in other words like i'm your number one bitch so yeah um she was described as being the type of person that wore her heart on her sleeve. She, uh, tempestuous, uh, very, very emotional. Basically, like, she didn't care if she felt something. She was going to let you know that she felt it. It's all right, girl. That's cool. She despised women who were, like, just, 
extra, I guess. Uh, no, maybe, maybe not extra. Maybe she was extra. They called it an excess of sensibility, which she had, which to me just kind of sounds like opposite of what she had, but whatever. I mean, I don't make up the words. I'm just going off of what they said, um, which by the way, when I was doing research on her, I could start off with the book and then I was like, okay, cool. Let me just, you know, see what's in Wikipedia. So I go into Wikipedia and then there's like a shit ton on her and I'm like, what the hell? Okay, cool. And then I start looking at the different resources, you know, how they list them at the bottom and whatnot. All right, cool. So I'm looking at that. And then that leads me to like all this other stuff. And I'm like down all of these different rabbit holes. And, you know, she was just being tweeted about November 10th. Yeah, November 10th of this year. And like, what is a woman from 1759 getting <laughs> tweeted about, you might ask. Well, so a woman, I know I'm skipping all over the place. But look, here's the deal. The way this is going to happen is I'm going to talk until I'm done painting. I maybe, I guess. And then if you're still interested in finding out more, you go do your own research because that's kind of what I love. I love hearing pieces of information and being like, hey, that kind of interests me. So I'm going to go look it up and I'm going to go find out everything I can about it. I don't know if you're like that. That's how I am. So, I mean, I, me personally, I would love to tell you the entire story, but do I have the energy and the time or the daylight um, to tell you everything? No, nor do I have the memory capacity. So that's just how it is, okay? Anyways, so Mary was just like full of emotions. She was just all about it. Again, if she had the feelings, she let you know. She let everybody know. And anyways, at some point she ends up like at 15, she decides she didn't want to get married. And then like sometime after that, she's like, you know, I need to go. I need to go do something. So they end up like, uh, I think setting her up as like a governess or something. What happened? Hmm. Okay, so this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. I'm over here trying to tell you a story about a woman that I'm completely fascinated by, yet I feel like as far as storytelling goes, there's just so much to compile and I don't want to give you just the Wikipedia version. So I'm just, I'm going to, I'm probably going to be mixed up on this, right? Okay, first of all, I was talking about her being tweeted about, right? So they wanted to commemorate her and this is like somewhere in in england right in the uk or whatever and they they wanted to commemorate her because see she's a she's a feminist philosopher she's considered like the founding mother of feminism and so you know they wanted to do something and so they they made this this woman was selected to paint or not paint to sculpt a sculpture and it was going to be the first sculpture for mary wollstonecraft and she ended up doing this one like out of, I want to say like silver and, and pewter or something like that. And um, it's like, it's, it like comes out like this, this like this sculpture thingy. And then there's like a naked woman on top. It's not supposed to be Mary. Some people thought it was, but it's not. It's just a woman. Um, and the woman is naked and she's got like the biggest bush ever. She got like hardly any hair on her head. But she's got like a humongous, I'm talking like, like a mop on her. I mean, look, look I'm, I'm out. Hair is cool. Hair is cool. I'm not hating. It just looks really odd in the sculpture, but I paint vaginas, pussies, whatever. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to knock another artist for uh, how they represent womanhood. Just not going to do it. I mean, I, I think if I would have done that, I, I just would have gotten a little bit smaller. But I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people really do have bushes that are just that huge. Um, 
and round. Anyways, um, so anyways, at some point, her sister Eliza has, um, like she, she has a baby and Eliza's husband is called, you know, not calls, but asked Mary to come and hang out with them and maybe help her sister because her sister, I guess, is having, um, just, you know, issues, right? And so Mary goes to help Eliza, who just gave birth to a little girl, and to try to make her feel better. But either Eliza or Mary, one of them convinced the other to that Eliza should run away. Basically leave the kid and run away. And so that's what happened. Mary helped Eliza to run away. And then when Eliza was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Mary was like, no, 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 you should totally do it. Um you know, like helped her kind of stick to her guns on that. And then everything just ended up going to shit for Eliza after that. And basically she ended up having to be like a woman with a job at that point because her husband basically didn't let her come back. Um, number one, because she left, but number two, because, uh, the, the little girl, the daughter ended up dying like before her first birthday. So it was just really sad. Um, and then at some point after that, Mary and her two sisters, Eliza and somebody, I don't know, one of her other sisters, again, probably that name that I don't remember that starts with an E, they went and uh, with her best friend, Fanny. So Fanny Blood, remember that name because she's kind of important. So they decide to open up like a girl's school. And, uh, <sighs> And then here's, here's where first Mary starts to like really shine. Okay. Um, she decided that even though she hadn't had like a formal education, she decided that she didn't she, like, she knew how she wanted the school to be. Right. She was like, all right, so we're not going to beat the kids and we're not going to teach them by repeating shit all the time. Like just over and over and over and over and over. She's like, I'm not, I'm not, we're not doing that. And, um, so they didn't like they 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 did things kind of differently whatever and in fact now um now nowadays um where that school was roughly in that area there's actually a plaque dedicated to mary for that and it was really weird I, I i didn't even know that at that time that women could do something like that i don't know i guess that would just i'm just slightly ignorant sometimes um yeah, I found that really interesting. Like they they opened up a school. Anyways, I thought it was cool. Um, the house my fight. So that they ended up closing the school because Fanny ended up getting married, and then Fanny got sick. So Mary ended up going to wherever the hell um Fanny was, and like kind of trying to nurse her or whatever. But Fanny ended up dying, and that really really like messed um marry up um because fanny is actually one of the ones that they thought was probably her girlfriend like that just the closeness that they had and i guess the letters that they would write to each other and just just the connection and then how much um, mary kind of pined for her you know so then some time passes whatever and uh, at some point mary decides to go to france now again remember she's from england and oh Wait, hold on before I tell you that. So where they had done the school at, right, was actually in a town of, I want to say resistors, but no, they were called, oh, something, dissenters. That's what they called. So the dissenters were people who, number one, um, okay, so the, the town that she was doing the school in, the town, the town that she was living in was made up of these people who uh didn't uh support that no 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 what are you saying what are you saying um the people who were the dissenters were um oh for the love of pete they were people who sympathized with the american war uh, with the revolution. Okay. Like they were people who were like, oh yeah, you know, America should totally be free. 
Um, and uh, they were also made up of basically anybody that wasn't like part of the Church of England. Okay, so uh, because and, 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 and that's actually how she was able to do the school was because those people um, were like not allowed to like go to regular school because of their church type beliefs. I want to say, was it that? Yeah, the Church of England. So these were people who were not Church of England. So you're talking about like Jewish people. You're talking about um, any of the other, you know, like Quakers and stuff like that. So anybody that was not Church of England they were not allowed to attend like the universities and shit. So um, a lot of those people ended up starting their own schools and where Elizabeth lived, they were actually very like pro woman um, and very supportive of women, just women being women. And so women were allowed to do these kind of things. Funny, cause I didn't remember that until just now. Anyways, so that's, that's how she was able to do that now um so at some point she ends up going to france and while she's in france she meets an american i want to say his name is george emily and she ends up falling like madly in love and i think at this point she's just like look i need to get some dick because she hasn't dicked around yet apparently she was living life as a lesbian or something who knows um so she was just like and and i'm i'm it's really not me kind of making that up. It's kind of really the way uh, she basically kind of described it. it was just she figured it was time and she didn't want to wait to be married. And so she'd fallen in love with this American uh, soldier who was like visiting over in France. And uh, then, you know, she ends up getting pregnant because he's an American. He's not like in danger of being in France at the time because it's like right around the French Revolution. And because she's English, she is. So he tells everybody and like kind of forges documents, whatever, to be like, oh no, she's my wife. That way she's like, she's not in danger, which ends up being, you know, for the most part, good for her. But then he ends up, I think, to go and fight in what I'm not 100% sure because I think the American Revolution was already over at that point. He goes off to fight or something like that. He leaves and then he doesn't want to come back and basically she's stuck with this kid um, and he had died, right? So she's like in France by herself with this kid but she starts paying attention to the war. Now that's where she is. That's like another time where she starts to shine. She starts writing and just writing and writing and writing furiously. And she basically documents what's happening with the war. And she writes one of her first um, book, pamphlet thingies, whatever. Uh, and that one was called the, the Vindication of the Rights of Women. And now, I don't know. I could have sworn that somebody else wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Men, and I thought it was some somebody like Thomas Paine. Basically, she was writing this in response to this guy who um, was very supportive of the American Revolution, but then when it came to the France, the French Revolution, he was like, nah, and he was like all pro-monarchy, which took everybody surprise by surprise, including Mary. And she was like, um, no, because so this guy had written something like saying basically like, hey, the revolution is cool. I remember what the piece was. If I maybe in editing, I'll put it up on the screen. And so then she and the, these other people just started writing like back and forth. And that time period when they were writing these things was actually known as like this, like a really civilized way of handling things because Basically, they would just write shit to each other, but like publish them. So they'd be like the pamphlets. Like I know if you've seen Hamilton, the Reynolds pamphlet, right? So like this is just what they do. This is how they would kind of solve and, and pass ideas off. It's actually in that. Like she was a woman who was putting out these ideas that people were reading and loving. And even um, Abigail Adams, so John Adams's wife, like she was influenced by her. And uh, I want to say Bronte also was, but maybe it wasn't Bronte. Maybe it was 
<sighs> nope, I do believe it is Bronte. Yeah, so she, even she was influenced by her. Like a lot of people were just like her writing was just that good, right? So she comes out with this vindication of women and of the rights of women. And um, people are like, oh, okay, dang. In fact, um, Aaron Burr, he even gave it to Theodosia, his daughter, to read. Like he insisted that she read it, that this was this was important work that Mary did. And then, so she has this baby and baby Fanny. And she doesn't know where the hell George went. George went off somewhere. So apparently he's like maybe off in Scandinavia or something. So Mary's like, all right, you know, let me go and see if I can, you know, get my man to come home, right? Maybe if he sees me and the baby, he'd be like, all right, I'm going to come home, be with you. So she goes out to Scandinavia. And while she's there, while she's on this trip, she goes and she writes more like that's all she keeps doing she just keeps writing and she ends up writing these beautiful um like stories about sweden or something or she's just writing these back and forth and these are like prized possessions too people are thinking like damn these are really good it became like a bestseller in fact the guy who was publishing everything for her she worked for him for a while and um she was actually able to like support herself for a while by helping work with him and in fact, uh, I think there was like a newsletter or something, right, that he ran. And she would write in there and uh, kind of like, kind of like reviews or something. And so she would review um, stories and she would talk so much shit about like the, oh, like the withering lass, like, oh, oh, the, like just the damsel in distress kind of heroine. And she would talk so much shit about girls who idolize those kind of characters and um yeah so she just mad shit about that anyways so the guy who ended up uh employing her and publishing her work like he ended up i, I want to say he ended up being like executed or something at one point um because he would publish the stuff that was like anti-monarchy um you know against um against the crown and oh and that was another thing so like the reign of terror um with uh uh you know when when king louis was um beheaded and everything like that um like mary wasn't cool with the people who were in charge of that and i don't know um like she even had a problem with the way they portrayed uh marie antoinette like she didn't like marie antoinette for whatever reason but she didn't like how, like, they were just being very vile about her and telling very vile stories. And she did not appreciate the fact that they had spread a story that uh, Marie Antoinette was, like, sleeping with her son or whatever. She was like, no, that's not okay. What else? Um, I really am fascinated with the part about how she was doing like the war corresponding thing because during the French Revolution and she was there and the fact that she was able to be there like the stuff that she wrote about people actually know what it was like to be a French citizen well okay just not a rich person it, it it's like the the everyday person's account that's what I'm trying to say what she was writing and you know that was huge because as far as historians go they have something to work with now they totally they're like okay we know what it was like and a lot of that of what we know comes from her that's another huge accomplishment thing that she did so these novels that she wrote she wrote one mary and another one maria um both of them are about um loveless marriages where like the woman is just not satisfied and she basically ends up having an affair in one of them she has an affair with a woman which i doubt is like sexually graphic in detail but you know i could be wrong maybe it is but um yeah so there's that um and the guy who published the stuff for her his name was like damn it Oh, what was it? It was like John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt or something like that. Joseph Johnson. That was his name. So Joseph Johnson, 
he's the guy that was doing all this um, whatever stuff for her, the publishing, the one that gave her a job and all this kinds of shit, right? So, I mean, she was doing pretty good for herself. At one point, she worked for a woman as a governess. And this is early on. I'm sorry about that. I know I'm skipping all over the place. But she worked as a governess. And the lady, like the kids loved her, loved Mary. The lady couldn't stand her because, um, I don't know, whatever, couldn't stand her. And then there was like somebody, some dude that the the mom, the, the wife, she had a crush on him. But Mary was single and she was like kind of pursuing him whatever and she ended up losing her job for that because she was going after the wife's crush whatever some bullshit so yeah just shit like that um yeah shit like that because that really explains it anyways so after after the war she didn't go back to new york after the war she went um where the hell did she go? I think she went back to England. Yeah, she went back to England. And uh, I don't know, at some point she had tried to commit suicide a couple of times. And I don't, I think that was because of George Emily. I don't think it was because of her second or, okay, so she never really married him, right? Um, and nothing really, yeah. I think she was just so torn up about that that at some point she did try to commit suicide a couple of times. Um, she tried to take like too much laudanum. I don't know, whatever that is. What is that? Like sleeping pill or something? I don't remember. Anyways, um, hmm. so she tried to commit suicide and that obviously didn't work. And then she meets a guy named... William Godwin and he and her they basically I don't know they kind of start off as like friends or whatever in fact well I think at first they don't like each other oh because I think I think they met at like a like a seminar or something like that conference something I don't know and he thinks that she's just like this annoying ass woman who just like won't shut up um but they end up falling in love with each other and um, they end up getting pregnant. And when it comes closer time for her to have her baby, um, she wants a midwife to help her, but there isn't one. There, a surgeon is the one that comes. And for whatever reason, in which you would think a surgeon would know, anyways, she ended up hemorrhaging and um, like the surgeon didn't, didn't heal her right or whatever, didn't, didn't whatever. And she ends up getting an infection and she dies 10 days later after giving birth to Mary, who ends up becoming Mary Shelley, um, the one who wrote Frankenstein. And, you know, after reading Frankenstein, there's a lot of like this emotional and just this, it's, it's just a strange kind of love, not strange, but there's such a feeling and an emotional, uh, like death is looked at differently. And then the relationship between the men comes across as, I'm thinking, like, I don't want to hear, oh, it was a different time. No, you know what? I take that back. Let's call it, so like non-toxic masculinity, right? There's just, there's a lot of feelings. Like you can always tell when a man was written by a woman or by a gay guy because there's just, there's that really loving, positive energy as opposed to the men being written as like machismo, whatever, right? Anyways, and then yeah, in the way that she describes um, Frankenstein's mom passing away, Dr. Frankenstein's mom passing away, it's just... I don't know. I don't know. Um, but that could also be influenced. No, uh, right now I'm talking about Mary Shelley. So Mary Wollstonecraft's daughter. Um, that whole thing could also be influenced by the fact that, so Fanny, Mary's first child. So after Mary died, she died at 38. So she was really young. 
after she died, her husband ended up um, eventually remarrying. And there was like, I think the wife had like two or three kids as well. But so he has little Fanny, right? So not a little Fanny, but he has the first daughter. So George Emily's daughter, he's raising her too. And like, that's a whole nother story, but she ended up committing suicide when she was 22. Really, really sad. Also a Taurus. So it just, just that, that, that passion. Like I just, I don't know. Sometimes I think that those, those passionate feelings are, you know, they're in our DNA and I don't know. I just kind of find it a little bit fascinating. Um, I didn't even find a picture of her daughter, Fanny, which was kind of sad. Um, anyways, there was some other stuff too. Give me a minute. Let me think. Okay. So then after she dies, um, her husband, William, he goes on to like publish these memoirs and like he, he publishes all of, oh, she had so much work that like hadn't been, um, hadn't been published. Like she didn't finish it. Right. So she had all of this work and, um, just a bunch of stuff that just was left unfinished. And I just, I find that so, so sad. And, uh, you know, I think that's probably one of my biggest fears is like, oh my gosh, what if there's stuff that I can't finish? What if I, uh, you know, run out of time? Definitely one of my biggest fears. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was so drawn to her. So it's just like, oh, relatable, totally relatable. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so what he does is he goes and he, he publishes a lot of her stuff posthumously, posthumously posthumously <laughs> but he also writes this memoir and it's like um i don't know if it's like reflections on or how he phrases it but basically it's about the author that wrote vindications of a woman or a vindication of women and uh it's it's met with such ridicule and it it ends up destroying Mary's entire reputation like people were looking at her like she was this um, philosopher and this person who really made a difference and no uh, this one one stupid uh, oh for the love of Pete this one story this one book this one memoir written after the fact that talks about how she was so passionate and how she um oh for the love of shit guys this is really hard this is really hard wow and especially since i know i'm like all over the damn place okay this is me just trying something new so hopefully my next ones will be a little bit better, but then again, I don't know. I don't know because telling a story to a camera, God, it looks so freaking easy when other people do it. I'm like, oh wow, like they can remember all this stuff. That's fascinating. And the cue cards and all that kinds of shit. And I'm like, I'm like high level stressing right now. Um, I have no idea what I was saying at all. It wasn't until roughly like last century, whatever, where she actually started getting a little bit better attention. I don't know. Well, that doesn't sound right. Not better attention, but more so uh, where people weren't like looking at her as if she was just some silly girl, right? That didn't happen until real, real recently. And... Um, and then so people have been like really kind of studying her and she's actually in a lot of English lit classes um, rather than just philosophy. Um, and I don't know, I'm just, I'm amazed that I never even heard of her. 
in, in just everything, everything. Like even, even with all the documentaries and everything that I've watched, I've never heard of her. And I just, I find it fascinating that this woman who did so much and actually was able to do so much. I mean, she was self-taught. She had these thoughts that she wasn't afraid to share. And she was able to very clear and concisely, um, like express them. And she just like, wasn't afraid to do anything. And then her husband comes along after she passes away. She passes away because some guy is completely inadequate and doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. And, you know, she should not have passed away. And it was just such a fucking tragic event that it, like, I'm just, I'm so in awe of this person. I'm, I'm so in awe of her. Just the more I read about her, the more I'm like, damn. Damn, like, she lived her life by her own rules. And at the time, her contemporaries, they all thought like, hell yeah, this woman is amazing. Yeah, this woman is kind of doing stuff. Um, and she makes sense. And have you read this? You know? And, and then for her to just basically be slandered. Because once that um, memoir that her husband wrote once that came out then it was like all over after that then other people started like really focusing on like her love affairs and the fact that she was just so emotional and then they started picking apart like things that she wrote and basically you know <laughs> letting misogyny just uh destroy her memory and it was so sad and granted she wasn't around for it right um she was dead but it was still absolutely outrageous to think that her memory was just torn through the mud and all of her idea oh my gosh no and all of her ideas were just kind of like thrown out the door and basically set feminism back like a hundred years basically so I don't know that I can keep talking um, about more while I paint this. So what I'm going to do is, so this was my very first time doing this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and end it there. If you want to read more about her, I'm going to list a bunch of links down below in the description box. And... The first one that I'm going to put is going to be this article um, that off the top of my head, again, I don't know. So is this one, I'll just start with the first one. If you read, if you read nothing else about her, read the first one because it really goes to bat to defend her and say, hey, uh, she was really pretty amazing. And if you want to see how this painting turns out, couple of things about the painting um again follow me on instagram hopefully i'll put it somewhere here on the screen um my thing to follow me on if you want to see how this painting ends up turning out and also if there's anybody out there that happens to watch this who would like to um like basically i want to donate it to possibly sell it and basically the proceeds go to something to do with Mary. I don't know. We will find some kind of organization, but that's kind of what I want to do. And I want to do that with the rest of the ones that I'll end up doing. I want to do this, um, thought I wanted to do this every Sunday, but now I'm thinking maybe every other Sunday because I think every Sunday might be, might be doing a lot, but we'll see. I don't know. Um, yeah that was probably a train wreck but if you stuck around and watched it thanks for watching okay have a great day be kind to yourselves and i love you bye